Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Forest Farming Non-Timber Forest Products webinar series. Um, my name is Mackenzie Rockliffe from the American Forest Foundation and also the American Tree Farm System, which is a program of the American Forest Foundation. And this series is put together in cooperation with the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, the USDA National Agroforestry Center, the USDA Forest Service, and the Extension Forest Farming Community of Practice. So we've got a great group bringing you this series. Um, but normally, the American Tree Farm System has a landowner webinar series every month. So if you're new to us, um, sign up for our events, and we'll send you notifications when we're having webinars. Um, the American Tree Farm System, if you, don't, if you aren't familiar, is the largest and oldest sustainable woodland system in America. We work to give our tree farmers the tools they need to be effective stewards of America's natural heritage. Um, a couple other bits of information before we get started with Ms. Becky Barlow. Um, this webinar is approved for continuing forestry education credits, so if that's something you're interested in, um, we will be submitting the list to SAF a month from now, because you have a month to watch the video if, if you know you have trouble today hearing or you know you have to leave suddenly during the webinar um, you'll have a month to watch it and then you can ask your questions in the chat box um, either about what Becky's talking about or if you just have any question I'll be monitoring that and um, she might answer questions as she goes along or m most people find it more comfortable to just answer at the end all at once and I believe oh Two other things that people always ask. You will be getting a copy of the slides, a PDF of the slides, and a recording of this webinar. So if you have any trouble um, hearing the webinar, uh, you will be getting a recording. Uh, sometimes people lose audio, and often um, the best course is to just refresh your browser. Usually it's an Internet connection issue. But Oh, and then I'll also make note, you might have noticed there's um, several, oh, we've got three more webinars coming up after this one, and actually one's missing from here um, in November, I believe. We have something on art products from the forest, so I need to update that. But so stay tuned, and now we'll pass it on to Becky Barlow to introduce herself about the wonders of pine straw. Thanks, Mackenzie. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for having us all here. I mean, having me here, and I'm happy to have all of you here um, interested in this. And the title of my talk, as you can see, is this fall for Get Raking the Leaves, Manage Your Forest for Pine Straw and Other Decorative Non-Timber Forest Products and Rake in the Profits. And I am an extension specialist with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, and I'm housed within Auburn University School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences. Um, that is a picture of me there with my pine straw baler. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. People often ask me if that's a catapult or something like that, but it's not. It's my pine straw baler. And um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Well, when I first um, thought about this, I, I looked at the list of great speakers that we've had so far with this webinar series, and a lot of folks were talking about things that were pretty much edibles from the forest. And I thought, well, with pine straw, there's a lot of things that come from the forest that are non-timber forest products that are not edible. And one of the things, too, that, that a lot of times people don't think about the non-edible products as forest farming products. And so you've heard a lot in these webinars about forest farming and how, you know, that's cultivating or collecting specialty forest products. And a lot of times, again, we think about those edible things like medicinal um, products, bee products, fruits, nuts, edible flora, and mushrooms, all these things we've either had some sort of talk about probably or will have a talk about. But at the same time, we don't think about those non-edible or wild craft items, maybe landscaping items. Even when it comes to forest farming, a lot of times people don't even think about pine straw as that. So I wanted to take the opportunity today to talk about a few things maybe you haven't thought about. Not all of these will be you know, suitable for everybody, of course. But just some that you know I've found that people are interested in and are doing that you may not be familiar with. Um, there are a lot of those are crafts and home items like black walnut ink, for example, bark baskets, 
fire starters or fatwood, and the floral industry is a huge consumer of these products. And then finally, um, we'll talk about kind of the big one in the industry, landscaping product of pine straw. So a lot of times people, when they think about these non-edible products, they think about them from a wild crafting perspective, which is harvesting kind of wild-grown NTFPs, their non-timber forest products. They don't think about actually, quote, unquote, forest farming. And it's interesting because people that are in the wild crafting area, they are kind of two, two different sectors of those. There are what people that consider themselves wild craft professionals, and they may have part or all of their income from the, from, come from the harvest of non-timber forest products, and they really follow the seasonality of these products or the regional vari availability of these projects, uh, products, and they really distrust a lot of the recreational harvesters and also the forest managers that may be associated with the land that they harvest from. Now, wildcraft recreationists, on the other hand, usually just harvest for their own to use as gifts, and there are a lot of times they're better connected with forest managers or other landowners because they're not, they don't count on all or some of their livelihood from these. So they're a little bit more open to talking to folks about what they're doing. Sometimes wildcraft professionals are considered a little, they, they keep their, where they're harvesting a little bit secret because they, it is their livelihood. Sorry, my. Changing the slides is a little slow. So why don't we consider these non-edible, non non-timber forest products when it comes to forest farming? And, and what I've found is that a lot of times land managers hesitate to recommend it. They, you know, they think about it as from a wild crafting standpoint sort of only. They maybe past practices of not being managed properly have really caused a lot of concern. And then also a lot of times land managers think about kind of the industrial forest management style of forest plantations, and they really don't think about this as an option. And sometimes, too, from that standpoint, they think about it more as a service to the public. They think, well, we don't care about these pine cones or these vines, so you don't bring any money into us. They don't, we don't care about the pine straw. So if people want to come out there and pick them up, yeah, suits us. We don't. It doesn't matter. Um, and sometimes they hesitate to recommend practice, practices that seem outside the norm. They may be, you know, something they don't think about or they don't really think there's any markets for it, so really not worth the time and effort to bother with it. At the same time, landowners also don't want to risk it. Maybe they don't know how to go about managing for pine straw or managing for some of these things, and they're afraid they're going to make a mistake. So a lot of times they just do nothing at all, which is, is not a good option always either. But the thing is, is they also don't realize that non-timber forest products can help them meet a lot of their objectives, which usually for small-scale forest landowners is high-value products maybe traditional high-value products in the terms of the timber, but also these non-traditional products can help them meet some of their goals too, whether it be improving wildlife habitat, water quality, or even forest aesthetics. So to get started, um, we'll talk a little bit about these non-edible land and landscaping non-timber forest products. And as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about a few things maybe you haven't thought about. Um, everything from the black walnut ink to the bark baskets, the fire starters, the floral industry, and then again, pine straw. And what I hope to do with these is not only talk about what these products are, but what are the, the trees or the other sources that, where they come from, and then also how you can sort of manage your property for these and, and have a responsible forest farming activity. So black walnut ink. Um, black walnut ink is actually used can be used in fountain pens, and there are actually, I found some documentation in doing some research where black walnut ink was some of the primary inks used in some of the different post offices in the eastern United States in, in the um, 1800s. So it is something that is a, a traditional product, and it's, it's funny, if you go out there and you just Google you know, black walnut ink or you go to a website like Etsy and look for black walnut ink, you can see I came up with a whole host of pictures that's just a small portion of them about the process of making black walnut ink and what it is and, and how it's sold. 
Um, you can also find those processes of uh, how to make it. It can either be kind of a cooked down process or a cold process. Uh, again, you can go online and find it pretty easily. One thing I found is that it sells for around $2 to um, $4.50 an ounce. So it can sell for, for a good bit. Oops, sorry, my mouse is a little tricky there. The, the thing about black walnut ink is it is produced from the husk of the black walnut tree seed. Um, this is a hardwood tree that's native to the eastern United States. You can see the map I have on the screen that shows the, the natural range of black walnut, so it's over much of the eastern United States. It's found a lot of times in mixed pockets and mixed cove forests, and um, again, it can be a highly prized tree. You can see the nuts, uh, the fruit in this picture, the greenish looking balls. Well, the black walnut ink is actually processed from the outside, the green outside of the nut. It's the part you don't eat. It actually covers the hard covering that you think about when you see a walnut. The good seed crops with these begin between the ages of 20 and 30 years old. The trees actually begin to flower mid-April in the southern part of its range until early June in the northern part of its range. And then these nuts, these large edible nuts, actually ripen in September through October. I'm very sorry that this thing is not behaving. Um, so if you go back to the ecology and management of black walnut, the seeds actually fall after the tree loses its leaves in the fall. And we have new black walnut trees regenerate either from black walnuts that are buried by squirrels that are forgetful and they leave them in the, in the woods and forget where they left them, or when you actually harvest a black walnut, a lot of times it will sprout back, and you can actually get new black walnut seedlings from that. So there are some potential benefits to landowners to thinking about managing for black walnut and black walnut non-timber forest products, because you can actually get more than just the black walnut ink that you could possibly produce, but it comes from that outer husk of the seed, which is something you're not going to be using anyway. It, it's um, actually something that the tree produces naturally. It could actually promote, if you start wanting to do this on a, on a somewhat larger scale, it could actually promote the natural regeneration of an often overlooked tree species that is, again, relatively valuable. And you get the additional products and additional benefits that come from the tree in the nuts. If you think about black walnut ice cream and things like that, it is... Um, Again, a, a product that is used widely. And then there's also, of course, wildlife benefits from having black walnuts. So that's, uh, excuse me, that's something that's, uh, again, probably most people haven't thought about a product that could come from a black walnut tree. Another thing is bark baskets. This is something that I've been familiar with for about 10 years now, and they've always sort of fascinated me. Bark baskets, the ones that I'm going to be talking to you about today are actually historically uh, came from the Appalachians and they were used as like berry picking baskets. They were really considered disposable. They were the paper bags of the day and so there's not a lot of old baskets out there to be found. But again, if you do a search online, you can find that these baskets will sell as, for as much as uh, $200 a piece. So they can be very, uh, very valuable and very beautiful. The way they're made, and historically the way they were made, was that the bark was actually removed from yellow poplar trees in late spring or early summer, again about berry picking time. And what they would do is once they removed the bark from the tree, they would cut a football shape or a cat's eye shape that would actually be scored in the middle section of this piece of bark. And then the bark's folded over and laced together either with leather or hickory. And then there's also a handle put on there either from vines or hickory. The first time I ever saw these made was with a, um, by a gentleman named Bill Alexander, and he's, his picture's there. And there's about a 30-second YouTube video that I have the link for up on the screen that you, you, know, you can go and see him explain this process. He's just a gem of an individual, very interesting and very knowledgeable when it comes to Appalachian you know, history and the making of these baskets. Um, and so I found them really interesting, and I always thought it was uh, Interesting to think about how you could actually use this as a non-timber forest product and actually manage for yellow poplar. And so, again, 
These bark baskets are historically made from the bark of the tulip poplar or the yellow poplar tree. This is a very valuable tree species, and a lot of times you think about it in the, the slopes of North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia, but it's also relatively common in, in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and into North Florida, as you can see from the range map that's there on the screen. Um, again, hickory is another tree that's sometimes associated with uh, yellow poplar, and it is also that inner bark is used for the lacing in the handles because it kind of has this stringy kind of bark. So it works really well for that. My apologies for this. Oh my goodness. And so yellow poplar trees, you can see there's what the leaves look like and the flowers. The thing about yellow poplars, they have a small winged seed, kind of similar to a maple seed sort of, has a wing on it like that, and it can tra those seeds can travel a long way. So they are a species that tend to regenerate in openings, and so they can and have a lot of, they produce a lot of seed, and those seeds can travel for a long way. So that's something to consider when you're trying to regenerate yellow poplar. Yellow poplar is then also, it also regenerates by stump sprouts, sort of like we talked about with the black walnut. So if you were to harvest a yellow poplar, it can sprout back. And the best way to actually regenerate yellow poplar is to remove some trees in small openings, maybe a half acre to five acres in size, and then those trees will then either seed in or they will sprout back in that area. Um, if you remove the trees in the fall, the winter, or the early spring, it promotes the best regeneration, and that would be the time when you'd actually want to be harvesting a tree or, or two, some small openings in your forest to actually harvest for the, the bark, for the tree, for the basket. So the benefits of thinking about yellow poplar management and, and using them and making baskets is you can actually promote the natural regeneration of this valuable tree species. It is a very uh, valuable tree species. The lumber is also used in furniture, the interior parts of furniture. So if you had the opportunity to actually work with someone, maybe you had a portable sawmill and you wanted to remove a few trees from your property, remove the bark from them and then to make your baskets, and then if you were able to work with someone who had a portable sawmill to saw up the lumber for you, it can be a pretty valuable and very useful uh, lumber. There's a lot of value as a honey tree, too. Um, you think about yellow poplar honey, it's very valuable. And then the seed has wildlife value for birds and small mammals. And again, when these baskets were initially made back um, in the 1800s, early 1900s, um, folks actually would just shimmy up a tree and cut the section of the bark out. You know, we don't recommend that. Instead, we're looking at using it as a management tool for your lands, maybe harvesting some of those weaker damaged trees rather than cutting the bark from a standing live tree. And then you're able to peel the bark off of the entire tree and use it to make several baskets. Again, there's actually some websites online that show how you can, can do this pretty effectively. Another one now, moving from a hardwood to one of our softwood species of uh, pines, is fire starters and fatwood. And um, it never ceases to amaze me about fatwood or fire starters. You know, during the holiday season, you may see it advertised as fat lighter or lighter wood. Again, you can go online and you can see many, many pictures of it. Um, it's also in a lot of your higher end catalogs during the holidays, sold as fire starters or fatwood. It usually sells for about $1.30 to about $2 a pound. And where lighter wood or fat wood comes from, it comes from the heartwood, uh, the limb knots, or the stumps, where tree sap is actually hardened within the tree. And the thing that makes it nice as a fire starter is that it burns very, very easily because it has all those resins in there, and so it can burn really well even when it's somewhat wet. The fatwood comes in from usually it's associated with longleaf pine. You can see the range of longleaf pine there. Uh, fatwood can also be found in shortleaf pine trees and then sometimes in loblaw and slash pine, but not as often. But again, you can see the range for, for longleaf pine right there. When you're thinking about longleaf pine management and how you might actually manage your forest and also manage it for uh, fatwood, you need to think about how longleaf kind of naturally regenerates and grows on the landscape. 
You can see from this picture it's kind of patchy. You have these dense areas of regeneration. And it is also a fire adapted species. And so it has this unique grass stage. So if you see the little green tufts in the foreground, those are actually longleaf pine seedlings. And they are actually developed that way so that if there's frequent fire on the landscape, those longer needles on the seedlings burn off but protect the inner bud and the, and the inner part of the seedling so it doesn't get damaged by the fire. So as I mentioned, you know, it is a fire adapted species and prescribed fire is really necessary for the continued health of a longleaf pine forest. But you can actually manage it, and this is one way you can actually think about managing for fatwood or heartwood, by removing overstory trees in small groups. And then the stand regenerates, as you can see from the picture here, with the, the group of seedlings in the understory. So it really mimics those natural processes of what would happen in nature if lightning were to strike an individual tree, that tree would then uh, fall over, die and fall over, and then the seedlings in the understory would come up and fill in that gap created by the tree that died. So some of the potential benefits of managing longleaf pine and, and looking at fatwood as a forest farming opportunity. Again, it can promote the natural regeneration of this valuable tree species. Longleaf pine is also um, imperiled species. It, lost much of its habitat over time. You can also look at it as improving the forest health by removing, again, those weak and damaged trees rather than, than cutting trees that are, are alive and healthy. And then because fatwood usually comes from trees that are older, you can look at increasing your timber rotations for higher quality products, um, such as pine poles. Pine poles are used to, they're the tall, straight, uh, pine trees that you see that also are eventually become light poles or power poles. The thing about poles is that they actually sell for twice as much as pine saw timber. So again, this is another opportunity for you to generate an additional source of revenue because you're extending your, your length of your rotation to also like, think about fatwood. Again, fatwood is something that is produced naturally. Um, you don't have to do anything special necessarily to get it. And finally, of my uh, kind of non-traditional non-timber forest products, or ones most people don't think about, is the floral industry, uh, where you would think about cones, and vines, and, and different leaves. The floral industry is a $34.3 billion industry. It was in 2012, that's what was reported. And if you think about the floral industry and you look at reports of the floral industry today, um, natural products, leaves, ferns, cones, mosses, very popular in floral designs. One of the things that the floral industry does have, however, is concern about illegal harvest. They do have a lot of concern about the poaching and destruction of plants and habitat to provide these products that they use, need, and that consumers want and need. So there is a lot of concern there. So forest farming can really be a benefit. So if you think about cones, Again, you've probably seen them if you go into a craft store. Um, you see these cones used in wreaths, arrangements, you know, flower arrangements, garlands. Funny the thing that I noticed was when doing some research for this project is found that the southern pines, and I have a picture there of a longleaf pine cone, then a slash pine cone, then the third one is a loblolly pine cone, and then the fourth one, the tiny one, is a shortleaf pine cone. All of these are very popular in floral arrangements. Um, they're also sometimes seen as fire starters. They dip them in wax and sell them as fire starters. But they can sell for 50 to a dollar each. Um, a lot of times they're sold in boxes of 100 or more from um, wholesalers and can be, it was amazing in how much they, they really did go for. It surprised me. Um, Western pines don't go for quite as much. That was another surprise to me. Um, Ponderosa, Jeffrey pine. Pinion pine and lodgepole pine, they sell for about half, somewhere around half of what the southern pines do. But they are also uh, desirable. Another floral product that's very popular and used a lot are vines. They're used to make wreaths, they're used to make baskets. A lot of times folks use muscadine vines. Um, so that's something, again, that occurs naturally. 
Something that occurs naturally here in the South that we're not super fond of is kudzu. Um, we certainly don't promote or say that you should grow kudzu uh, to farm it, to make fine baskets and wreaths. However, if you were to use it as a way to eradicate kudzu from your property, then that would certainly be a good use of it. Um, prices for vine wreaths and baskets range from $10 to $100 based on the, the size and quality of the basket that's produced. Oops, sorry. Leaves are another uh, floral product that is uh, again, very popular. Again, if you've been to craft stores, you've seen the stems of preserved leaves. They're a lot of times dyed and preserved and then put on floral picks, usually 10 leaves or so on a pick. A lot of the oaks that are really popular that are used for this are turkey oaks. Folks in northern Florida, southern Alabama, southern Georgia, um, there is a big turkey oak market in that in that leaf market in that area. Black oak, white oak, or other leaves that are sometimes used, and those go for approximately a dollar per preserved branch. So when they're sold in retail outlets, so those are something that again your trees are producing anyway and harvesting those that can be a forest farming opportunity. One leaf that's very common in the floral industry that there is a lot of concern about are Gaelic leaves. They are very very expensive. Um, 80 cents to two dollars a leaf. One of the things that's a very big concern with the Gaelic leaves right now is that the wild populations, especially in the area around the Appalachians, are being poached. They are because they are so valuable. They are wild populations of these are being severely damaged because of people harvesting them illegally. This is again something we really, of course, do not. Uh, think you should do, but if there's a way that you can actually, the use of forest farming could actually help relieve some of the pressure off of these wild populations and actually improve them long term. So finally, I want to talk about pine straw. This is kind of the thing that for a while I think Pine straw was sort of the elephant in the room that uh, nobody really talked about. They certainly didn't think about it as a a forest farming enterprise. But I think when you see, hopefully when you get through this presentation, you will see that it really has a lot of potential for, for folks. So pine straw, I, I did a presentation on pine straw a couple of years back and I was in some of the New England states and I didn't define what pine straw really was. I forgot being from the south that, well, everybody knows what pine straw is used for, uh, but that's not always the case. So. Pine straw is a really a popular landscape mulch, and the, we take the needles that fall naturally, and it's usually from longleaf slash or loblolly pines um, during the fall months, usually about now, September, October, and into November. So these needles are naturally cast from the trees during this time. And I know we've talked a little bit about longleaf, but I was just going to give a brief overview of a little bit about why these species are usually the preferred species when it comes to pine straw. So longleaf pine, again, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but one of the main reasons it is one of the preferred species when it comes to pine straw production is the needles are so nice and long. They're usually 18, 18, 8 to 18 inches in length, inches in length, and then they're in bundles of about three needles per fascicle. Again, you saw the cones are really large cones, but because longleaf is a fire-adapted species, its needles are thicker and um, more rigid, and they also have this nice kind of reddish-brown color that looks really nice against the green of your bedding plants and your grasses. So because they have this thicker needle, it lasts a lot longer when it's placed in the landscape. So those are a couple of reasons why it is, is really one of the preferred uh, pine straw products. The next one that I want to talk about is slash pine. It's usually kind of second in line as far as preference goes. Its needles are also long, but not as long as a long leaf, usually 5 to 11 inches long, with about two or three needles per fascicle. Again, uh, it, this species usually grows naturally within about 150 miles of the Gulf Coast or the Atlantic Coast, um, but it is not as fire adapted 
as long leaf is, so its needles are not as rigid and not as thick. So it doesn't hold up quite as well as long leaf does long term on the landscape. Loblaw pine, however, oh my goodness, I apologize for this. Loblaw pine is kind of the third in preference of the southern pine species when it comes to pine straw raking. Loblaws have about four to nine inch needles that have about three needles per fascicle. The cones are about six inches long. You saw the picture of the cones, and they're really pr real prickly to the touch. That helps you identify if it's a loblaw pine because those cones are so prickly. Loblaw pine is more adapted to wetter sites, so it's not really a fire-adapted species. Its needles are much thinner when you feel them. They don't feel as thick and as rigid as a longleaf pine, and so they are they deteriorate much more quickly on the landscape. They also have this sort of grayish color that they turn when they get older, so they don't stay as nice looking as long as maybe the slash pine or the longleaf do when used in a landscape situation. So it makes them a little bit less preferred over the other two species. So when you're thinking about pine straw, you usually think about these three species, the longleaf, the loblaw, or the slash pine. And then what happens is when they cast those needles in the fall, Usually, they are then raked in December or January. They're bundled up, either using a mechanical raker or a hand baler, as you see in the picture there is my hand baler. And then they're sold to retailers or landscapers who use it as a ground cover. The interesting thing about pine straw is I found that it's not just a southern thing. A lot of times people think, well, you just the southern pines are the ones that you get pine straw from. Um, I found some reports from the Great Lake states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota where they were actually looking at red pine and eastern white pine as potentials for pine straw raking. It was kind of amusing in the report they admitted that they would never be able to compete with the southern pines when it came, came to uh, pine straw production for landscaping, but they did feel like there was some opportunity locally and regionally for these two species to kind of form as a substitute for southern pine pine straw. Another thing that a lot of people don't realize is that pine straw raking is really not a new idea. Um, sometimes people think, well, this is a recent occurrence, but it's, it's really not. I found this really great publication from 1930 by W.R. Mattoon, and it's called Profits from Farmwoods, Money-Making Examples from Southern Farmers. And I have the link there if you want to go out online and you want to find it, it's a PDF. But I really like how it says it has a whole section just on pine straw. And it says that A.B. Williams from Wade, North Carolina, makes regular income selling pine straw from his 10-acre patch of pines. He sells the straw in the ground at a rate of 25 cents per cartload. And I've got a picture in a minute what a cartload might look like. Um, as an acre produces three to five loads, and his net income is from 75 cents to $1.25 per acre yearly. Then another farmer in Fayetteville, North Carolina, makes his chief living from raking pine straw and selling it in town for $3 a load. In the strawberry sections of the south, pine straw unraked on the ground brings $2 per acre in North Carolina and up to $5 in Mississippi. Um, if you think about what pine species would have been there during this time, Mississippi probably had a good deal of longleaf pine, actually, so that could have made for the price difference, which is still probably the same today as you will you'll see a little bit later in the presentation. You know, I mentioned you might see what one of those cartloads looked like. You can see that picture on the left is from Florida, um, and that is actually a cartload of pine straw. Um, the funny thing was is I was coming back a few years back with some students from actually a pine straw forestry field day, and we got behind this truck with on the, the picture on the right of the load of pine straw. And I got to thinking, well, maybe a lot hadn't changed in the last 70 plus years of how the pine straw industry is. And the pine straw is, industry is fairly loosely organized. It's starting to gain a little bit more traction and a, starting to get a bit more organized in some states. Some states are a little bit more organized than others, as we'll talk about in a minute but I just thought that was a kind of a humorous comparison. But if you think about how the pine straw industry is organized, there's a student uh, named Vanessa Casanova who graduated from Auburn in 2007. 
And she actually looked into the pine straw industry and how it was structured at that time. And this structure is pretty much the same. The prices, again, are from 2007, so they're not exactly current, but this is based on her report. And what she found was that a landowner usually signs a contract with somebody who's a pine straw dealer. This pine straw dealer then looks to find forced labor contractors who then have people who actually rake the straw. And you can see how that was um, the price per bale, how it would break out with about 50 to 65 cents to the landowner at that time, about a dollar to the forced labor contractor, and then about 70 to 90 cents to the person who actually did the raking, and then the pine straw dealer got what was left. So sometimes the landowner may go directly in contract with a forced labor contractor. Sometimes the pine straw dealer has the own people that rake for them. It can vary a little bit, but in general, that's kind of how the industry chain is organized. And when you think about states that are the most organized when it comes to pine straw, Georgia is by far the leader um, looking at pine straw production. They have so much pine straw production that they actually report it as a commodity. And so you can see how their prices or the amount of pine straw that was actually produced in millions of dollars has gone through time. They had a high from about 2007 to 2010 at about $80 million kind of leveled off, gone down to about $60 million in the last couple of years. But you can see that it still contributes to almost 10% of Georgia's forest products market is just pine straw. And so one of the things we sort of started wondering is looking at this and all this potential for pine straw, we started to think, well, what about other southern states? Are we missing the boat on that? And so I had a student named Janice Dyer who actually looked at some of the pine straw potential across the southeast and then in Alabama specifically. And so she had kind of a three-part project where she looked at what is the potential for pine straw production across the region. And so she looked at it uh, from a longleaf perspective because we had some data that we'll talk about in just a second to actually see how much pine straw could be produced on an acre of land. And then she looked and talked to folks across Alabama who bought and sold pine straw and kind of what they were looking for to get a better idea for what, what the market was like. And then finally, she talked to some Alabama forest landowners to figure out how willing they were to actually have pine straw raked on their property and how familiar they were with the market and how things worked. And so that's what the next part of my talk is going to be, is kind of talking about what she found and how it can apply not only to Alabama but across the southeast. And so the first part was their pine straw yield data. So she had some data that was from naturally regenerated, even-aged longleaf pine stands. And this is part of a larger study that was actually established in 1964. So it's a long-term study across the southeast, and you can see the counties there where the data came from. And it was this pro project was originally established to look at the growth and yield of longleaf pine. Well, over a period from 1993 to 1997, pine straw yields were sampled monthly. And so she took, Janice took that data from the monthly samples and was able to develop a model for pine straw production. And this is the model right here to estimate essentially the number of bales per acre per year that you could potentially get off of a longleaf pine forest. And so it's a long equation, but it's, it's, if we break it down, it's not too bad. So if you're trying to determine your bales per acre per year, you essentially take 1.266 and you multiply that times your basal area of your forest. Now, if basal area is something you're not familiar with, you're not a forest professional, and you are not familiar with the term basal area, we do have some publications on the Alabama Cooperative Extension website that talk about basal area and what it is and how you calculate it, or you're welcome to email me, um, and I'm happy to, to get that information to you. But you take 1.266 and multiply that times the basal area of your forest, and then you add the age of your forest times a negative 0.266. And then you add to that the number 1.228, and you multiply that times your site index. And again, if you're not familiar with what site index is, we have some information on that that we're happy to get to you as well. And then you add the number 21.043. 
And when you add all that together, that's going to give you an estimate of your number of bales per acre per year that could potentially be produced off of your long, using longleaf pine as an example because that's the data she had. We don't have data for slash pine or loblolly, but this is a start if you have longleaf pine. And again, there's the kind of the criteria that where the data set that she had came from, they had between 30 and 151 square feet of basal area. The stands were between 18 and 40 years old. Site index was between 56 and 79 and then had between 150 and 1,400 trees per acre. So there was a wide range there. So if your property would fit into one of those, you know, range it into those ranges, then you have a pretty good estimate of the number of bales per acre per year you could get off of your land if you were looking to manage for pine straw. We also have this as a spreadsheet where if math is not your thing, then that's no worries. We have a spreadsheet where you can plug in your numbers and, and it can estimate it for you as well. So after that, uh, we started talking to pine straw buyers. So we looked at kind of the metro regions in the state of Alabama, um, you know, around Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, uh, Mobile, those areas like that. And so we asked them about what they looked for when it came to pine straw that they purchased and sold in the state. And there are some telling things here. One of the things was what species of pine straw did they usually purchase? I thought it was interesting that almost 20% of the folks that we talked to did not know what uh, species they were selling. Um, that's not unusual. I've run into someone who said that they were selling shortleaf pine straw. Um, if, I don't know if you're familiar with shortleaf, but shortleaf needles are just a couple of inches long. I always wondered how you might bail that up. It might not work so well. Um, but yeah, sometimes people don't know what they're selling. Uh, about 40% of the folks said that they purchased or preferred to purchase longleaf pine. Then about 37, 38% of the folks said slash pine. And then about a quarter of the folks said loblolly pine. So you can see longleaf is the preferred species there. We asked them then where did their pine straw come from? Where did they purchase it? Again, about a quarter of the folks didn't know where their pine straw came from. Um, I found that to be the case. If I go to try and purchase pine straw, I always ask, so where did it come from? They either have to look at the side of the truck or maybe they're not real sure. But another thing that I thought was really interesting is about a third of the respondents got their pine straw from over 150 miles away. That shows you that there is an opportunity to ship pine straw for a very long distance or also that maybe pine straw could be raked in other areas and, and sold a little bit closer to home. When they were asked about when was their busiest season for selling pine straw and when was their least busy, with one being their busiest season and four being their least busy season, you can see there that the spring months, April, March, May, then followed by October, the fall month of October, is when their busiest months for selling pine straw were. Um, it's interesting to note that needle falls typically highest, as we mentioned earlier, in September, October, November. So there's quite a lag from the time when the needles fall to when they're raked then in December and January and then when they're, they're later sold in the spring months. We also asked them about the bales and the shape of the bales that they preferred. Uh, most of these were retail outlets, so they preferred the square bale shape, which that's probably what you've seen if you've seen them at a, at a discount store or a home improvement store. 77% of the folks preferred the square shape because they're easier to handle. Uh, you're looking at uh, residential owners coming in to buy these, maybe put them in the back of their truck or their vehicle. These are a lot lighter. A square bale weighs about 12 and a half to 13 pounds. A round bale, on the other hand, is about twice that. So round bales are more often used in uh, more professional folks that are doing large-scale operations like universities or res larger residential developments. So they want larger quantities of pine straw that's easier to handle for them, the round bales. The baling method, most people said they preferred machine baling just because a lot of times it was a little tighter bale. They didn't have to worry about the bale falling apart as much. But then 27% you know, of the folks said they had no preference and about 20% said they liked the hand baling better. 
And overwhelmingly, folks said that they'd rather have twine rather than wire on the bailing. And then finally, we asked them when it came to pine straw characteristics, what did they really find was the most important in the way that the pine straw looked? And that was no weeds or briars, big deal with pine straw and something you really need to think about if you're looking at managing your forest for pine straw is dealing with invasive species. You really cannot have any invasive species when you're looking at baling your forest you know, for pine straw. We, that's something you definitely want to control. We don't want to spread invasive species in the pine straw. Another thing is no foreign materials, no trash. Um, in the understory, that's something you definitely want to keep out of there. And color is really important. They want that vibrant color, and that's where longleaf comes in because it has that nice uh, golden brown color. You can see harvest locally was not super important to folks, but I think it's because you can't get it locally a lot of times, so you have to just take it wherever you can get it. And then finally, uh, Janice talked to folks in six Alabama counties kind of outside, that were kind of the more rural parts outside of these, around these urban centers. And she asked them about their willingness to actually harvest pine straw off of their property. And so when it comes to who's most interested in pine straw production, about 60% of the folks who own pine forests in Alabama express at least some level of interest in harvesting their pine straw. About 40% were not interested at all. Of the folks who were interested, they usually owned some sort of pine stand, of course, uh, either natural or planted, planted pine. One thing that was interesting is they'd usually used a consulting forester in the past 10 years, which meant they were interested in some sort of active management on their forest land. And also interesting was that they usually lived outside of the county where their forest land was. So maybe they were looking for another source of income that they could get from their forest land without having to be right there on the forest to make it happen. So what were their concerns? So if you said, okay, you're maybe interested in, in harvesting for pine straw, but what is it about it that maybe you're not doing it because you're concerned about something? The main thing was they thought about was lack of market. And that's something we're finding more and more across the Southeast when it comes to raking pine straw. A lot of times landowners are interested in raking it, but they really can't find anyone to do it. So that's one of our biggest problems with helping promote the pine straw industry and helping landowners get started. Lack of information, they just, again, it was that notion of, oh, I don't know what to do, and so I don't have any information, and I don't want to make a mistake, so I'm just not going to do anything right now. Um, again, also was investment in the maintenance costs up front of how do they get their land in shape to harvest for pine straw. When I ask about how much revenue was expected, um, most folks were willing to accept about 50 cents to a dollar per bale for their pine straw that was baled off of their property, and that's a fairly reasonable expectation. That's about what most people that I've found are raking their pine straw in Alabama are, are getting right now. So why were they making these choices? Why were landowners saying, you know, making these choices it was interesting to see that there was kind of no relationship between where the landowner w was located, what species they owned, or how many acres they owned. And so it kind of suggests that maybe they're not real uh, informed about the pine straw market. So in other words, a landowner who owned longleaf pine really didn't say, oh, I want more money than somebody who owned loblaw pine, where the longleaf is, again, a more valuable uh, species when it comes to pine straw production. One thing we did see was that those folks who lived in the same county as their property expected to get more for their pine straw than folks that lived outside of the county. Again, thinking about it as kind of an absentee landowner um, perspective where they're not as tied to the land as somebody who lives right there with it. So if a landowner is interested in getting started, in pine straw production, what are some of the things they need to consider? So based on uh, what we found in this, uh, Janice went on to write a publication. You can see the links there at the bottom. It's called Harvesting Pine Straw for Profit, Questions Landowners Should Ask Themselves. And it's through the Alabama, 
Alabama Cooperative Extension System. And so the things you kind of need to think about is what species do you have now and what are your long-term objectives to what you want to grow long-term from a timber component? Do you want to grow longleaf or are you in an area where you could grow longleaf? Or is slash pine or loblaw more kind of your objective? Those are going to influence how much pine straw you're going to get long-term and also the prices you'll get for them. How does your land lay? If it's very steep, then that's something that's going to impact how your, your pine straw can be raked. It's going to have to be hand raked as opposed to flatter properties that can use a machine that can be raked. I'm preparing the site. Again, what does your understory look like right now? If you have a lot of woody vegetation in the understory, it might not be, it's not going to be well suited for machine raking, but you might have an opportunity to hand rake it. And when I talk about machine raking, something I didn't, I apologize I didn't talk about earlier, machine raking is usually some sort of a modified hay baler that's pulled behind a small tractor. And they actually then, it's, it's raked up and baled. And a lot of times those round bales that you see are, are actually machine raked. Doesn't have to be just the round ones, but that's often the case. Um, then hand raking again makes the square bales and is usually one of those wooden balers like you saw the picture earlier. Um, how often is it going to be raked? The intensity of your harvest? Um, you have to make that decision. There are pros and cons. If you, I usually recommend that you don't necessarily want to rake it every year, and it's not something you're going to have as a long-term project. You may rake for a few years and then stop raking to kind of let your site recover and then maybe pick up later, or it might be something you want to rake every other year. It, it all depends kind of on your objectives and what you're trying to do. You know, if you're interested in wildlife, you might want to think about the understory component and what your raking is going to do to that. Should I fertilize or should I not fertilize my stand? A lot of times folks think, well, I'm raking this pine straw off, I need to fertilize. Um, with longleaf pine, we found that fertilization is really not a good option. It actually can actually hinder the growth with longleaf pine. For a species like loblolly, who uses a lot more nutrients, you might need to fertilize. This is going to be a case-by-case -case basis depending on your soils and, and how much you're raking and what species is there. And then also to burn or not to burn your forest. With longleaf pine, burning is, is necessary. Uh, Loblaw pine is not as necessary. It's similar, same thing with slash. So you have to consider that. Do you want to burn or not burn? There is um, some evidence that shows burning can promote needle fall. You have to think about the timing of your burning. You need to burn far enough ahead that you can have those fresh needles fall and then rake them up and not um, burn up your needles that you're going to be raking. So a lot of things to consider. And again, it's, these are all going to be influenced by what your objectives are and where your property is. You know, I mentioned some drawbacks like wildlife habitat. There are, with anything, there's, there's pros and cons. Um, some of the potential drawbacks of pine straw raking is impacts on soil and water resources. Depending on how you rake, these can really be minimal, but that's one of kind of the biggest thing, limitations is when you do rake for pine straw, especially if you rake very intensively, it increases your soil temperature and also uh, removes that understory so you can have more soil erosion. So it's definitely something you want to think about. Again, a lot of times I suggest that folks not go with a super intensive raking strategy. You can, if you want to do some sort of uh, low impact raking, you can use a pitchfork to actually lift the pine straw up and, and use a hand baler or just using a rake and you can have a lot of your, your native understory stay in place. Um, one of the things also that's been found, the Forest Service a few years back did some studies to look at pine straw raking impact on tree growth. And one of the things they found is that it did impact tree growth, height growth slightly, um, nothing that they found was statistically significant. Um, so overall, it seems like it's not really impacting your tree growth that much. It's more concerns with your soil and water resources. And then there's always wildlife habitat. Whether it's for mammals, like the, the small deer that's shown here, or herptofauna, snakes, lizards that are, live in that understory, you, you have to consider how you're going to be impacting wildlife habitat. Unfortunately, there's not a, a lot of good studies out there right now. There are a few that are starting to, to come out about how pine straw can potentially impact uh, wildlife habitat. And again, it comes down to how you're raking. If you're intensively managing and raking every year, that's going to have a much bigger impact than if you're hand raking and raking every other year.
But then come to some of the benefits of pine straw raking. It is compatible with many land uses, as we've mentioned. It's really not going to impact your ability to harvest your timber. It's not going to impact the forest aesthetics. And depending on how you rake it can actually imp and manage your forest, it can actually improve the understory for, for wildlife. Um, it can be effectively used on marginal or poorer quality sites. And then um, it also can be a primary or a secondary product. I know some folks would say, I'm never cutting a tree. I'm just growing pine straw. That's their objective and, and their priority. Um, I think there are some opportunities to actively manage lands after CRP program projects expire. Um, that's one thing a lot of times I'm talking to landowners who have their lands are going out of the CRP program and they're like thinking about what they can then do next. And rather than walking away from their, their uh, CRP stands, they're actually thinking, okay, I'm going to continue to actively manage this and use pine straw as a way to continue to manage my forest. One thing, too, to think about is you don't have to rake it yourself. You can actually have a lease opportunity with someone to help you rake it. And what a lot of times they will do is they will rake their, prop, their pine straw for quote unquote free for the first year. And what they do is they help you then they spend the upfront money to get your understory in shape, which can be really good if you have a lot of woody material in the understory. They can help you with prescriptions for, for fire, for herbicides, to, to actually manage your understory, get it sort of under control. And then in the subsequent years, then they will pay you per bale or per acre to rake your forest. You know, these prescriptions should always be done by a professional land manager and someone who really knows uh, what they're doing, and all herbicides should always be put out by a licensed contractor. So to kind of wrap up, you know, I think the time's really right to consider the responsible management of non timber forest products and kind of putting them into that forest farming category, even though we don't think about them a lot. Um, I have a landowner friend that I worked with who lives in southwest Georgia. Uh, he has really made pine straw raking work for him. This is a, several years ago. His longleaf pine it was actually a civil pasture. This was in the wintertime. So there wasn't a lot growing in the understory. He was going to have to think about thinning his trees. He was grazing cattle in the understory, and then he'd pull his cattle off um, in the early fall and let his pine straw fall, and then he was raking the pine straw. You can see those large round bales there off of his uh, the understory where he, had, where he had his longleaf pines. So he was getting multiple products from one acre. He, was, he had his cattle. In the spring and in the summer, he'd pull his cattle off and he'd rake his pine straw in the wintertime, and then he was able to put his cattle back in later. So he was really making it work for him. So to kind of conclude, you know, non-timber forest product management isn't for everybody. You always have to weigh your options. And remember that it's not a plant it and leave it system. These are things that have to be actively managed. They are going to take you getting in there and, and making those decisions. You always need to consider the economics of anything that you do. Is this really going to be, again, right for you? And then you always need to understand the ecology and management of any of the species that you're working with, and because those differences can really impact your longer-term land management decisions. And, you know, early on I said, you know, so why don't we, why don't a lot of people consider forest farming for forest farming of these non-timber forest products. And so in the end I say, so why don't we consider it? Um, using these forest farming techniques, we can really benefit some different non-timber forest products enterprises. We can strengthen markets and enhance the management of wild populations that could be threatened by some of the practices that are going on now. We can use it to restore habitats and forests and help landowners meet their objectives and maybe long-term actually re improve relationships with land management professionals so that we actually are able to work together and think about this as a whole system. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, and I really thank you for your time. We had our pine straw baler out at a ag field day uh, about a month ago. The kids really loved baling the pine straw. You know, I asked my kids if they loved baling pine straw. They said, no, thank you. But uh, it is a lot of fun, and we even had Aubie, Auburn University School mascot out there helping us bale some pine straw as well. So with that, um, I was going to try and go and see what questions we had. Take some quickly. 
So one of the questions we had early is um, nutrient cycling impacts of harvesting pine straw. Um, hopefully talked about that a little bit. Again, some of the issues that people worry about is, you know, you're raking up the needles. Well, the needles, by the time they're cast off, have really pretty much um, used up most of, of the good they were doing to the tree, so that's why the tree casts them off. Where I think you have more of the impact is what is in the understory and the understory plants that you're impacting. Again, if you use kind of a lower impact raking process, um, you can actually have your understory grasses in vegetative material and, and not have to get rid of it all, or that's where most of the people worry about. Um, there was a question here that said, is there no interest in red or white pine cones? Those are actually out there. White pine cones are something that uh, are used. I didn't see any for sale, but I have at, when I looked out and did some of my early research, but they are used and I have seen them in things. I, I personally really like white pine cones. Um, think they're really beautiful. And you do see them in some things, but they weren't listed as popular as um, the Western species and then also the Southern species. Um, again, there's the question of taking pine straw. Does it reduce the fertility of the forest? Hopefully we've addressed that question. Um, if you have any more questions about that later, I'm happy you're happy, you know, welcome to email me and I can send you some of the publications and links to things that I've found that kind of address that issue. And then finally, uh, well not finally, there's another question. What is the minimum acreage for marketing pine straw cost effectively? That's something that really depends on how intensive you are going to be managing it. Um, Usually to get your raking done, people are looking for you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 acres at a minimum. It again it depends on what your species is and how much pine straw, you know, how many bales per acre you're actually producing. That's going to really greatly impact how willing folks are to harvest your pine straw. Um, my landowner friend in southwest Georgia that I mentioned, um, he doesn't have a very large uh, piece of property, but yet he's getting his pine straw raked just because he has such high quality straw, it's very much in demand. Um, this next question in baling, I guess for small operations, hand baling would be preferred using twine. Our baling tends to cut the hands and harder to work with. That's very true. Um, and the, most of the box balers, like the picture of mine, that I've showed you is set up to use twine. The, the baling um, boxes, that they need that flexibility just the way that you load the, the string into the box. It needs to be something that's, that's easy to work with. And twine is harder to get off and harder for landowners to use. Let's see, the next question here was, what about any soil changes when using pine straw for ground cover? Um, that is something that you, know, you need to think about if you are using pine straw in your landscape. I have not seen anything that talks about that, but again, pine straw is, is usually more preferred over uh, cypress mulch for sure because the cypress mulch is something that you're actually grinding up the whole tree and uh, using that, so that's definitely something that a lot of people are, are trying to get away from. But as far as soil changes when using pine straw for ground cover, I have not seen anything published on that. That doesn't mean there's nothing out there, but um, if you would like to send me an email, I'd be happy to do some more digging and looking to see if we could find anything on that. And then there's one, uh, someone found a link to environmental concerns for pine straw. Um, the, e the web address for that is essmextension.tamu.edu forward slash pine straw forward slash health.html. So that's one someone found out there for environmental concerns of pine straw use. And then here's a question, Texas, do you have any data or info on retailers or vendors buying pine straw in East Texas? There is actually um, a pretty good website that's actually out of East Texas that actually talks about pine straw baling. I don't have that website off the top of my head, but again, if you'd like to email me, um, again, it's Becky, B-E-C-K-Y dot Barlow at Auburn.edu. I'd be happy to send you that link. Um, where can I get a wooden baler? Well, that is something, there are two sets of plans that are actually out online. 
that you can where you can actually make your own baler. Those my baler I used kind of as a combination of those two sets of plans. Um, it's not exactly straightforward with the plans. There are some things that we've had to modify. For example, um, my baler actually the plan actually calls for using a piece of plywood for the plunger on the baler, but I ended up we ended up having to modify that because after we baled a few dozen bales of pine straw, the, the plywood plunger broke. So the kind of the flat part on the plunger. So what we ended up doing is reinforcing it and using two pieces of two by four for our plunger. Um, the forestry club at Auburn is actually getting into making pine straw balers, wooden pine straw balers. So if that's an interest and you live relatively close by to Auburn, <laughs> we would be happy to make you a baler. But um, there are plans out online. And again, if you'd like to email me, I'm happy to send you that link. LSU um, actually has one of the sets of plans, and then the other one is out of the Texas Forest Service, I believe, is where the other set of plans is. Um, what is the best way to find buyers for non-timber forest products? Again, this is something that's tricky and it's not as well organized as we would like. That's one of the big things we've found with the pine straw industry is it's, again, just very loosely organized. And so trying to find folks to purchase them it's difficult. Same thing even with, you know, I found with the pine cones and things like that. I actually did some searching around to see if we could try and find people that would buy these products. And it was it was not clear at all how you actually sell them. So that's kind of the unfortunate thing. The things with like, and that's one reason I started looking at things like the, the walnut ink and the baskets. Those are things you could actually sell, make yourself and sell yourself. Um, online. That's another thing I found is people actually selling everything from the black walnuts to the pine cones through things like Craigslist and and again on Etsy and places like that. They're just marketing them themselves. Um, there's more design questions for the pine straw baler. Hopefully I answered that one. Talked a little bit about baling equipment. Again, usually if you use a mechanical baler, it's usually a modified uh, small hay baler. Um, the cost breaker for a landowner to chemically treat understory and what products are used. Again, that's going to be very, very specific to what your forest stand looks like, what your soils are, um, and you know, what you're trying to control. My best suggestion is to either contact your state forestry agency or your in NCR, your uh, local soils office and try and see if they can help you and make some recommendations or get a consulting forester or professional land manager to help you. Again, that's going to be a very specific question for each piece of property. Um, question is what sort of rake is best? Um, I have found that actually a, a somewhat uh, rigid, like a metal leaf rake tends to work really well. Um, you can, so any sort of, the plastic rakes are, don't tend to do as well, but sort of a metal leaf rake is what we've been using and it seems to work pretty well. Thank you for your kind words here. Some folks have said they appreciate the presentation. I appreciate y'all tuning in very much. Um, so with that, I really, again, appreciate your time, appreciate everyone um, spending part of their day to, to hear this presentation. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions y'all might have. If you want to email me, I'm, I'm happy to chat with you more about this. And hopefully, again, this presentation was useful. And thank you very much.